Good afternoon and welcome to our series of webinars focused on bringing you information about COVID-19 related topics. The information in these weekly webinars is geared toward long-term care and skilled nursing facilities, but we encourage everyone who's interested to attend. My name is Kathy Caudill. I'm a communications specialist with Quality Insights. Today we'll be discussing finding the fix for falls. Everyone has entered the meeting on mute, but we will have a discussion following the presentation. If you have questions or comments, please submit them using either the chat or the Q&A tool in your Zoom menu. And you can also raise your hand to request to be unmuted to ask your question out loud. We invite you to join us every Wednesday at 2 p.m. for more of our weekly webinars. Next, next week, we'll have a live Q&A for nursing homes with our panel of health experts. If you have a question you'd like us to discuss during that webinar, you can submit it in advance using our online form, and I will drop the link in the chat shortly with that, um, where you can find that form. That webinar will be at the same time and place next Wednesday at 2 p.m. And now I'd like to introduce our guest today, Patty Austin. Patty is a quality improvement specialist at Quality Insights. She has been working in the skilled nursing arena for the past 29 years, starting her nursing career as a nursing assistant and leaving the front lines as a director of nursing. Patty has been with Quality Insights since 2016. She considers it, she considers it a privilege to be able to interact with so many different nursing facilities to help create lasting change within their communities. Patty, thanks for joining us again today. Thanks, Kathy. It is great to be here talking with everybody again today. And, you know, I have to admit, I'm a little bit excited to talk today because I have the opportunity to talk about a bit of an unexpected result of the recent COVID crisis. And what that is, is a marked increase in our fall rates. I think we can all agree that falls have been and most likely will always be a large part of our quality improvement efforts. So really, the topic isn't anything new. But what is new is our need to really put on a different hat and try to figure out why this crisis has led to such a dramatic increase in our fall events. We know that individualizing resident care plans, identifying those at risk, and vigilant safety rounding remain the call of the day, right? But we're looking for what has happened during the COVID crisis that has led to this unexpected outcome. So I'm proposing to you today that one potential cause for this anomaly might very well be something as simple as communication. We have staff that's still trying to recover from COVID burnout. We have facilities that are experiencing unprecedented staff turnover and a higher than ever use of staffing agencies. And all of those things point to the potential for the communication that we've always committed ourselves to improving, being at a greater risk than ever to kind of allow those cracks in our processes to appear and lead to unwanted events. So today we're gonna to take a look at falls and how communication or lack of good communication can impact those rates. <clears throat> we're gonna talk about some techniques and some tools that would be beneficial in helping to reduce those avoidable events. And we're gonna look at a scenario that helps us to conceptualize the tools that we're gonna to mention. Tools like SBAR, stop and watch, the CUS technique, post fall huddles, and tracking and trending tools will all play a part in what we talk about today. So, we're gonna quickly review some of the tools that are available to help us reduce falls, but we're not gonna spend a ton of time on them because I'd like to devote as much time as possible to the scenario and then kind of talk that through a little bit. The first tool that I have up, there are actually two tools and they work hand in hand and they are my favorite tools. It is the stop and watch and the cuss tool. Most of us are most likely familiar with Stop and Watch. It's designed to be used by frontline caregivers and even ancillary staff. Um, and it gives them a forum to bring their concerns forward in a very formalized way. Hand in hand with that is the CUS technique that is a little bit less well known and can be a little bit, um, I don't want to say difficult but 
it can be tricky to implement in a way that makes it feel non-punitive. If you are able to adopt that technique in a way that everyone recognizes that it is not designed to be um, pointing a finger, it's designed to ensure that we're all working toward mutual goals and that we all recognize that things fall off of everyone's plate. Um, it is a fantastic tool that can really strengthen communication, particularly among those frontline caregivers and ancillary staff and the clinical staff. Then, of course, we have SBAR, and we're all quite familiar with that. What we might be a little less familiar with is a actual fall SBAR that was designed to be used as part of a post-fall huddle using the SBAR format. Um, and we'll take a closer look at that as we move forward. Next, we do have um, available a data collection tool for those of you that are not using something already to track and trend your falls. This is just a small sample of it. Um, there are many fields that you're able to complete and it will help you dig down to mutual root causes. If you have um, areas that are at greater risk within your facility, even if you have staff members that may be involved in more events than you would consider um, average. What I really like about the tool is that it will take all the data that you input into it and change it into graphic form. So if you're more of a visual person, um, you will be able to see your data in real time transferred into uh, graphs and um, bar charts. Pretty nice. You'll be seeing it come up in the last minute lowdown pretty soon. So those are all of the tools that I wanted to mention today, and you will see all of them pop up in some scenarios, well, a scenario that we're about to take a look at. So try to follow with me as we talk about what probably is an event that could happen in any of our buildings um, at any given time. We have our main player, um, from a staff perspective, is Lynn. She's a nursing assistant, and she's on her way back from break. She rounds the corner onto her unit, and she hears her resident, Mrs. Dahl, calling out from her room. It's about midway down the hall. That's really unusual for Mrs. Dahl. Lynn knows she was having an off day today, but for her to be calling out is um, cause for concern. She's actually having so much of an off day that Lynn decided to use a stop and watch tool earlier in the day and report it to the nurse. As she's hurrying down the hall to the room, she wonders for the second time today what the doctor said about the concern she voiced on her stop and watch that morning. When Lynn enters the room, she saw that Mrs. Dahl had indeed fallen and she had some blood trickling from a skin tear on her arm. Mrs. Dahl was a little bit agitated in trying to get up, so Lynn quickly activated the call bell and she called out to the hallway for immediate assistance. Then she sat down next to Mrs. Dahl to try to keep her calm and in position while waiting for the nurse to arrive. The nurse arrived on the unit and she did determine that it was safe to move Mrs. Dahl back to bed and she took care of cleaning the skin tear and uh, dressing the wound, then went to call the physician and the family. Very soon, she returned to the room to tell Lynn that Mrs. Dahl was going to be going to the hospital at the request of the family. So the team, Lynn and the nurse, recognized that they had some time before the transport company arrived, and they started to do their post-fall huddle with Mrs. Dahl because she was still in the building, and they knew that she would be able to provide valuable insight. So they used the fall S-bar and began to do their analysis. In this facility, the person who's in charge of the resident at the time of the event leads the post-fall huddle. And that's really a good practice um, if you're not already using that technique. And because the nursing assistant, Lynn, was responsible for Mrs. Dahl at the time of the event, she's gonna lead our huddle. And the nurse is then going to record the data that they gather during that huddle. 
Since Lynn knows that Mrs. Dahl is leaving the facility soon, she begins by asking Mrs. Dahl what she was doing at the time of the fall. Mrs. Dahl states that she was trying to get up to go to the bathroom. Lynn, because she knows Mrs. Dahl so well, recognizes that she usually rings the bell and then waits for help before going to the bathroom. So she continues and she asks Mrs. Dahl, what was different today that made her try to get up alone rather than waiting? She's actually directed to do that right through the fall S bar. Mrs. Dahl said to Lynn, you know what, I really had to go and I didn't think I could wait another minute. Remember this morning, I waited for you and I almost didn't make it. The other thing that Lynn noticed at the time of the fall was that Mrs. Dahl's walker was still folded and at bedside. So while she still has the opportunity to question Mrs. Dahl, she asks why she didn't use her walker. Mrs. Dahl kind of looked a little bit confused when she was asked that question and doesn't notice the walker until Lynn points it out to her. And then she says, oh yeah, that thing, I guess I forgot. Again, Lynn recognizes that that is not normal for Mrs. Dahl, who is usually, usually very attentive to following her care plan interventions. And Lynn wonders to herself, I'll bet I'm right, and Mrs. Dahl has a UTI. Then the ambulance crew arrives. And while they're preparing Mrs. Dahl for transport, the nurse continues to complete the fall S bar. Once Mrs. Dahl has left the facility, Lynn begins to start the root cause analysis for the events. The nurse is posing the question and Lynn is responding. So the nurse asks, Lynn, why did Mrs. Dahl fall? And Lynn says, you know what? She tried to go to the bathroom without waiting for assistance. The nurse follows up with, why didn't she wait for assistance? And Lynn says, well, she thought she would have an accident if she waited. The nurse asks again, why did she think that? And Lynn reminds her that, well, she almost did have an accident this morning. And the nurse says, why do you think that happened? Lynn then says, well, I think she has a UTI. She's a bit confused today. She didn't eat her breakfast well. And then she was almost incontinent. That's why I turned in the stop and watch. What did the doctor say? The nurse replies that she had not yet had the time to call the doctor. So let's stop our scenario right there. And we can easily point to a failure in communication as one of the potential root causes of this event. But looking a little bit deeper, really, we have three different areas to look at, right? The first is, what does the communication look like between the nurse and the frontline staff when they bring a concern up? Remember that closing that communication loop serves multiple purposes. First, it conveys to the frontline the outcome of the concern that was, that was brought forward. And it also allows care plans to be updated in real time. And second, it also promotes the feeling of team. And that feeling is needed to provide not only good care by ensuring that frontline staff is aware of what the action is, but maybe even more importantly, it reinforces the idea that the information that the frontline staff has is valuable. We know that nothing is going to kind of circumvent good, strong communication um, as quickly as, a, as it will if somebody feels like they're just, you know, spitting in the wind, so to speak, or talking to a wall. Um, that frontline staff will be much more likely to bring their concerns to the forefront in a way that you can take action on if they recognize that what they're bringing to the forefront is valuable and acted on. So first thing we need to know is if this facility has a policy on follow-up related to stop and watch forms. If they do, was there a breakdown in that process? And if they don't, they may need to consider implementing one. The second area for review <laughs> is the need for follow-up communication 
by the nursing assistant herself. If she had used the cuss technique, she may have raised the sense of urgency behind that original stop and watch. And as I said, that can feel uncomfortable when you're first implementing it, but it really should be the standard. It's not intended to be punitive in any way. We all know, you know how quickly a day can snowball and things can fall off of anyone's plate by simply returning to the nurse the first time she wondered about the outcome of that stop and watch and voicing that she was C, concerned that Mrs. Dahl might have a UTI and U, uncomfortable because she was not herself today and then felt that it might be an S, safety issue the nurse might have um, recognized that this was a situation that required a more urgent approach. A few different things might have been put in place that could have prevented that fall. The nurse might have done an immediate bedside assessment and called the doctor more quickly. Temporary interventions may have been put in place while determining what exactly was going on. Better communication between staff may or may not have prevented the event, but in this scenario, we have no way of knowing that because the communication failed. We're not gonna spend a ton of time today examining the other area of communication that most likely could have been done a little bit differently, but the SBAR absolutely comes to play in this scenario as well. Clear communication may have prevented an avoidable ER trip in this case, Mrs. Dahl had a little bit of confusion. She had a skin tear that was easily treatable in the facility. And had the nurse relayed the information to the family in a concise, clear way, including what they were able to provide to Mrs. Dahl at the facility, they may have prevented that ER transfer. Finally, it's going to be vital that communication to the ER is pretty strong. The receiving facility is going to have to understand the capabilities of the facility so that the resident can be returned in the event that something like a UTI is diagnosed, maybe some IV antibiotics are ordered, and the facility is capable of running those antibiotics under their roof. So without that strong communication between um, the facility and the ER could very well lead to an avoidable admission. <laughs> so that is all the prepared information I have for you guys today, but I would love to engage in any discussion you would like to have related to any scenarios that you, may come to your mind or any barriers to communication that you're seeing and would like to discuss a little bit further. Kathy, I will turn it over to you for any questions or comments. All right, thanks, Patty. So we did have one comment early in your presentation. Uh, I think when you were talking about the, the cuss technique, it said, my medical director takes great offense to I am uncomfortable presentation. Well, I, I would, then maybe ask Dr. Storm what her thoughts are there. I think a lot of it, in my opinion, is approach. And if he were maybe to understand um, the rationale behind it, he might feel a little bit differently. What did you think, Dr. Storm? I would love to know why. Do we know why? Can you put it in the chat or unmute yourself? If you would like to unmute yourself, you can raise your hand and we can. Um... Okay, yes. All right, you're, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Um, he, he thinks it's like, if, if we say we're concerned, he thinks it's, we're concerned that he doesn't know what he's doing most of the time. <laughs> like, like we would say we're concerned about this resident. We she might have UPIs. Like, not everybody has a UPI. <laughs> Or we think this medicine's making her dizzy. Oh, I'm treating her, not you. I, you know, I, I will tell you, I've worked with medical, I continue to work with medical directors. And I think that's a really challenging thing um, when 
it, and, and I don't know why it is. It sometimes feels like when you question a medical director, they feel like, you know, you're questioning their care. I would just say that directly say, you know, I'm not, we're not questioning your care. We're just trying, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to reduce falls. We're trying to, you know, I would, I would just tell them, you know, this is, this is what we're trying to do. We're really not um, questioning your care and then ask them like, what would you like us to utilize? What, what are your ideas around, you know, this, this goal and reducing falls and, and see what, you know, they come up with what the medical director comes up with. Um, I try to utilize that technique and try to like engage, get their opinion. Like what, what would you, what would you like to utilize? And usually they say they don't have anything, (laughs) (laughs) you know, because this is what we do. We develop these wonderful tools and and techniques and um, so they can be implemented. Um, But I understand that medical directors are busy. Physicians are busy. And so they're not on that side of things. So you can just, you know, ask them, what what would you like for us to use? And you can, if you ever have um, any other questions, you know, about dealing with your medical director, you can reach out to me directly. I've been a medical director for a really long time. I've worked with medical directors for a really long time. And I do education for um, medical directors for becoming certified. So um, if you have any questions around communicating with your medical director, feel free to reach out directly. Well, he is rather new, so we're starting to get a feel for each other. Yeah, it's challenging in the beginning, right? Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> well, yeah. I've mostly an ER background. We have to educate a little more. And I, and I think that that's really challenging because I, a lot of physicians go into long-term care medicine thinking it's just primary care. It's just primary care. And it's not. Long-term care medicine is the most highly regulated area of medicine, and it's going to get worse. I think now that um, the pandemic, the public health emergency is over. And so I would just share those concerns you know, that this is really, really different. We're dealing with a lot. And um, you can share my email and say, you know, the, the, I've I've worked just in long-term care for a long time and I can appreciate now like how it's very, very, very specialized. Mm-hmm. So you just might need to kind of do a gentle approach and, and um, you know, over time, hopefully opinions will change. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for your comment. And that's Dr. Jean Storm, who is the medical director at Quality Insights. I put her contact in the um, the chat. It's uh, jstorm at qualityinsights.org. And I also included Patty's contact. If you'd like to reach her, it's paustin at qualityinsights.org. And if anybody else has any questions or comments, please go ahead and submit them at this time using the chat or the Q&A. Or you can also raise your hand if you would like to request to be unmuted. And while we wait, I'm going to run over a couple quick closing items. Um, Again, I'd like to invite everyone to next week's webinar, which will be a live Q&A on all topics with our panel of health experts. That will be Wednesday at 2 p.m. And I put a link in the chat earlier with a form where you can submit a question in advance. And I will put that in again uh, before we're done here today. We also invite you to bring your questions to our virtual live chats each Tuesday and Thursday at noon. Uh, Deborah Wright will be there to answer your questions on topics such as quality improvement initiatives, infection control, or MDS coding. You can find the links to the live chats and the webinars in the newsletter we send out each Friday called the Last Minute Lowdown. And if you would like to receive that newsletter but don't think you're on the mailing list, you can email me at ccaudill at qualityinsights.org and I will uh, get you on that list and I will drop my email in the chat now. And that's it for questions so far. We haven't gotten any more so far. So we'll just wait another minute here. You know what? I will follow up on what Michelle was saying um, related to the medical directors. It's also one of the barriers if you try to implement CUS within your nursing staff. So from CNA to nurse, you will have nurses that find that offensive as well. So if you're not using CUS, probably a good idea prior to implementing it 
is to hold some staff education so that everybody understands that it is not about pointing fingers. It's not about saying you're not doing a good job. And you might even consider using that cuss terminology to go both ways. You know, so a nurse aide might be concerned over confusion related to a safety issue. And a nurse might then tell the nurse aide that she's concerned over the lack of mobility on a or for a resident who hasn't been repositioned in two hours. So if that terminology, the concern, um, I can't think of the acronym right this second, but if that cuss terminology becomes second nature, unlike it is to me right at this minute, um, it'll be easier for you to implement and for everyone to recognize that it's just a method of communication, not a um, slap on the hand, so to speak. Thank you, Patty. Um, we have a question here. It says, do you have any resources for post-fall interventions? Do you mean uh, such as what intervention would you apply in any given circumstance? I'm not sure what you're you're looking for. A lot of the um, pre-made uh, interventions that used to be a little bit easier to find has have kind of disappeared um, simply because, the focus is on inter or individualizing um, to as great of an extent as we're able to. Um, I'm not, see it coming up here, care planned interventions. Yeah, she said callers are tough ones, right? Um, we're doing a little fall work group right now, and that that is the topic of the day. You have those frequent fallers that have diagnoses of dementia, and then there are those frequent fallers because they choose not to comply with their care plan interventions, and both are very, very different. Um, this is what I would recommend, Michelle. <clears throat> Reach out to your quality improvement specialist um, and have those discussions with them. For example, I might not be able to point you to a list of interventions, but I have the experience of speaking with many different facilities who have tried many different things, most of which you probably have as well. But sometimes we're able to shed some new light on things just by virtue of how many facilities we talk to and how many different interventions we see attempted. One comment says, I have trouble getting my staff to identify something besides observations. Okay, so the key with that is really looking at what prior life experience was, getting the families involved to see what that um, life history looked like, what matters to the resident. I love doing these kinds of interventions. You know what, give me a call and we can talk all about it. Those, those are so fun and it is so satisfying for both your staff and the resident when you stumble across that, that crazy thing that um, is just what they needed. All right, thank you. And that's it for questions and comments so far. Uh, before we wrap up, I remembered that I wanted to let everybody here know about another webinar that's happening next week. I didn't have it in my notes for today. Um, it is going to be on Tuesday, June 13th at 10 a.m. It is called Preparing for New Regulations for Long-Term Care Facilities. July 1st is just around the corner. And I'm going to drop a link in the chat shortly with a flyer that has more information about that webinar. It is eligible for nursing CEs. It's a 90-minute webinar. We'll have an expert presenter, Paula G. Sanders, uh, who is a uh, who is a lawyer at uh, Principal and Chair Healthcare Practice Group, Post and Shell, Attorneys at Law. And that webinar is going to be about um, the that on July 1st, 
the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services will implement new federal regulations for state survey agencies of long-term care facilities. So uh, Paula Sanders will be uh, addressing that in this webinar. So that flyer will have more information about the CEs, the learning objectives, and where you can register. And I don't see any more comments, so I think we can wrap up here today. I'll be emailing um, everyone later this week with the recording from today's webinar, the presentation slides, and any other links that we had here today to share in case anybody feels like they didn't get a chance to copy something down or copy down that contact information. Um, so uh, you'll be seeing an email from me later this week, probably on Friday with that information. And that's it for questions. So before we sign off here today, I'd like to um, ask everyone to please answer a short evaluation of today's webinar. It is anonymous and will show as a pop-up as soon as the webinar ends. So if you have a couple minutes to fill that out, we would appreciate it. Patty, I'd like to thank you for joining us again today. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us and we hope to see you back here again next week.